And because of a lack of discipline in many, we have to talk about certain subjects. And when we think about certain subjects in the scriptures, we can't help but to think about drinking. And so this morning we're going to be talking about uh, drinking. And we need to talk about it because we live in a time where it seems as if it's all right to just drink. And unfortunately, we live in a time where Christians are supporting it. And so the brethren have asked me to bring forth a lesson concerning excess of rioting. And when we think about excess of rioting, I want us to turn our attention to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. I know we had Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18 read, and we will be looking at that here in a few minutes. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable abominations, idolatries. In regard to these things, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same blood of dissipation. I believe the King James says excess of rioting. Speaking evil of you, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. When we stop and we consider the time that we live in, many are doing what they believe is right. Unfortunately, we know for a fact that man needs to live according to a standard, and that standard is God's standard. Amen. Remember what Jeremiah said, and my dear brother Kenny said, I can take my time, and so I'm going to take my time. Jeremiah 10 and verse number 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that will walk to direct his steps. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Unfortunately, we have too many that are in this world ordering their own steps. And they're ordering their own steps as it relates to the subject that we want to talk about, and that is drinking. Friends, in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse number 18, and we're going to break this particular passage down in a few minutes, especially from the original language. And it's important that we look at that because when we consider the original language, it teaches us many things. In Ephesians chapter 5, in verse number 18, notice what the Bible here says. And do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess or dissipation but be ye filled with the Spirit. Now I had him read verse number 19 because that's very important. Because this is a worship context. And the very fact that it is a worship context, that ought to be teaching us that when we come to worship, we need to be sober-minded. But not only should we be sober-minded in worship, we need to be sober-minded all the time. And so going back to that idea of 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 4, they think it's strange when we teach and preach and live out a sober lifestyle. Yes, and what soberness is as it relates to God is different as it relates to the world. And we need to keep in mind that because of the Bible's teaching, now, in my notes, I said the strictness of our leaning on the scriptures. But the more I think about that, it's not that we're strict, we're compliant. Right. 
<laughs> we're just wanting to be compliant to the word and the will of God. And so let me say this, and this is free, you ain't got to give me nothing for this. But it's interesting that some people will call you a legalist. But if you stop and think about that, the opposite of a legalist is an illegalist. So which one do you want to be? Do you want to be legal or illegal? And so people call you a legalist. Well, a legalist is one that adheres to the law. And so what we're doing is just adhering to the law. And there's nothing wrong with adhering to the law. And so when we think about our stance, our stance is not pharisaical. Our stance is biblical. And so people think it's strange because we do not walk in excess of rioting. And so when we think about the idea of rioting, especially in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 4, that's the idea of living a life of whose moral behavior is not on par with the word of God. Brethren, did you get that, brothers and sisters in Christ? That is a behavior that is not on par with the word of God. Here's the question. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 15, the Bible there communicates to us that we must be walking circumspectly, not as fools but as wise. Notice this, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The idea of walking uh, circumspectly, Brother Eric, is the idea of walking the tight rope, the straight rope. Is there anything wrong, answer me now, is there anything wrong with walking the straight rope? Nothing wrong with it at all. There's nothing wrong with being a person who has their eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of their faith. There's nothing wrong with keeping your eyes on the Lord like we're supposed to. Why? Because he's the author and finisher of our faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 13, we notice something in this particular verse that's very important to our study on this morning. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 13, we address this passage here on Friday, but I didn't address a particular word because I knew I was going to address it this morning. In verse number 13, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Notice the next two words, be sober. Be sober. Comes from the Greek word nephos, N-E-P-H-O-S, nephos. We get our English idea of nephology there. A nephologist is one who studies the clouds. You think about a nephos, it literally means to be free from cloudiness. You know what happens when you're not sober? You're, you're not free from cloudiness. Your mind is cloudy. Now, when you think about anything that intoxicates the body, it intoxicates the mind, whether it is drugs, whether it is alcohol, whether it is sex or pride, it does not matter. Yeah. If it clouds the mind, it clouds the judgment. If it clouds the judgment, one cannot see Christ clearly. One cannot see the word of God clearly. One cannot live the life that God desires for them to live. In 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse number 8, I'll be right where y'all want me to be around 2 o'clock. We'll just preach till we can't preach no more. And y'all can eat later on. Right like now we're going to eat the word of God. Amen. When we think about the admonishment that the Christians were given by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 8. He says, but let us who are of the day. Now look at this, friends. Be sober. There's our word right there. Put it on the blessed breastplate of faith, love, and the helmet, uh, the hope of salvation. Notice the idea be sober. Be clear-minded. God wants us to be a people who are clear-minded. Why? Because when one is sober, 1 Peter 5 and verse number 8, we can see the devil at work. We don't have to trip into things. We don't have to find ourselves into matters that are ungodly and not pleasing to Almighty God. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 5, I'll get my tongue together here in a minute. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 5, we see this idea again. But you be watchful. There's our idea in how many things, brethren? Oh. All things. What does this have to do with drinking? Everything. 
And the reason why is because when one is intoxicated, when one is drinking, then their inhibitions begin to wane. They're not thinking clearly. Hold on. I thought Christianity was about thinking clearly. It is. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 7, here the Bible demonstrates to us how we need to be a successful people. Successful in what? Notice in verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, now notice the translation in the New King James rendering, be serious. There's the word there. But I thought it was sober, watchful. Uh, be serious and watchful in your what? In your prayers. Brethren, we cannot be serious and watchful if we are not sober in mind. And so the Bible demonstrates to us that we should not be running in excess of riding. We should not be engaging in ungodly behavior. We should not be acting as if God is not navigating our lives. And so we have to ask ourselves a series of questions. Number one, what is drunkenness? Number two, we need to ask ourselves, can we know the truth about drunkenness? And number three, I think this is the most important uh, question. Do we care what God says about drunkenness? Ephesians 5.18, point number one. I got five points. You know, remember, I think it was, was it yesterday I had two points? That was unscriptural. Now I got five points. That's unscriptural. <laughs> That's fine. Point number one. Let's define drunkenness. In Ephesians 5 and verse number 18, as we study the Bible together, the word drunk there in Ephesians 5, 18 comes from the Greek word methusko. The idea of methusko, listen to these definitions, brethren, to make drunk, to become intoxicated, to grow drunk. To be made softened by wine, to be inebriated, overwhelmed or overpowered by spiritous liquor, intoxicated. I broke that word intoxicated down. When you break it down, the word in means inside or enter. Toxic is poisonous, venomous, dangerous, harmful. Get the picture? You think of intoxication. When one is putting a toxin in their body, Brother Jason, they're putting poison into their body. They're putting that which is harmful inside of their body, like this definition, that which is dangerous. It causes one to lose control of their faculties and their behavior. Wherein, when you think of the idea, look at Ephesians 5 and verse number 18 again, wherein is dissipation or riotous. And when you think of the uh, translation of excess, now, I'm not trying to be ugly, but the lazy Bible student would look at the idea of excess, Brother Eric, and say, see, you can't drink too much. But that's the lazy Bible student. The diligent Bible student, 2 Timothy 2 and verse number 15, study to show yourself approved. The one that Jesus speaks about in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. The Bible student that is exercising himself in righteousness understands that the word dissipation is more accurately rioting. The idea of rioting is the idea of behavior that is not conducive to Christian living. Brethren, that's the word of God. That's the definition. When we think about rioting, rioting is dealing with behavior, not overwhelming or overdoing alcoholic beverages. The same idea is seen in the 1 Peter 4 and verse number 3 text. Notice 1 Peter 4 and verse number 3. Now we read verse number 4 and made emphasis upon that, but look at verse number 3. In verse number 3, we see that, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. You think about this in verse number four. In regard to these things, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of excess, dissipation. Well, hold on. Can Is there ever enough? Let's just look at verse number three. Is there ever enough lewdness, lust, drunkenness, drinking parties? 
abominable idolatries. Is there ever enough of that? You better believe it is. It's too much of it. And so he's not talking about excess of those things. He's talking about these behaviors, Brother Kenny. These behaviors are behaviors that are behaviors that one is out of control with. And we live in a time where people are very much out of control. And so the idea of wine, I want us to look at this from a Hebrew perspective in Greek. The Hebrew word for wine is the Greek uh, Hebrew word yayin. It literally means to be used, it's literally used in an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic way. It's seen in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 31 as alcoholic and Isaiah 16 and verse number 10 as non-alcoholic. Now it's interesting that when we're studying the word of God, that we need to be diligent students of the word and realize that the context is also going to determine the word. Context is king when you're studying words. In Proverbs 23 and verse number 31, Proverbs 23 and verse number 31, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. This is uh, this is an alcoholic context right here. In Isaiah 16, 10, Isaiah 65, 8, a non-alcoholic context. We see this idea also in the Greek language from the word oinos. It's literally from the definition juice squeezed from the grape, the blood of the grape. So here we're talking about not the skin of the grape, but the actual inside of the grape. And when they would press the grape in the wine press, Brother Kenny, the blood would come out of it. The juice would come out of it. And they would take that and they would drink that. That's non-alcoholic. This is seen as it relates to John the Baptist in John chapter 7 and verse number 33. And the Bible demonstrates that he was to neither eat bread nor drink wine. Alcoholic. Now think about this, friends. There's a difference between wine, yayin, oinos, and strong drink. Strong drink. Look at Proverbs 31 and verse number 6. In Proverbs 31 and verse number 6, we understand that uh, strong drink was given to one who was dying. Sounds like something medicinal. I would say it's the modern day morphine. Would you agree? Modern day morphine does not sound like anything recreational. Doesn't sound like something one would be taking just to be taking it because he wants to feel good all of a sudden. Sounds like medicine. Isaiah 5 and verse number 11. Woe to those who rise up early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink. Brethren, we stop and we consider, is there a difference between wine and intoxicating drink? The Bible makes a distinction between the two, just like it makes a distinction between male and female. Amen. And so with these definitions, we can see that we can be very precise in our thinking. And we need to be brand new. Yes, Point number two. Let's talk about some drinking passages. Because we need to consider this. In Proverbs 20 and verse number one, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whoever is led astray by it, notice the end of that verse, is not what? Wise. I don't see how anyone who has any level of wisdom from God would ever say it's okay for me to drink wine and strong drink. Why? Because the Bible clearly demonstrates that one is not wise. Now, let's go back to Proverbs 23. We're going to be all over this Bible. We don't apologize for that. In Proverbs 23, starting at verse 29, I told myself I'm going to read this. Let's make some comments. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. We see that. We see when people have had too much to drink. We see when people have started to drink and they start to lose their way of thinking. Their eyes become bloodshot red and they want to go and have more and more. That's not wise. Notice, those who go in search of mixed wine. Put Isaiah 5 verse number 11 as 
uh, a little side note. And then he says, do not look on the wine while it's red, uh, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. And notice verse number 32 and 33, friends, this is very important. At the last, it bites like a serpent, stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. Your heart will utter perverse things. It's amazing. I think the old people, when I was a kid, used to call it liquid courage. Y'all remember that? Liquid courage. You find yourself saying things that you normally wouldn't say when you were sober. You sit there, and it's amazing. A little old guy want to sit there and fight some 345-pound guy. Say, come on, I'll take you on. That's why he's uttering perverse things. Then he finds himself pummeled on the ground and wonder what happened to him. Amen. Well, you was talking bombastically, and you got bombastic. <laughs> and so you got to watch yourself. And that's why he says you need to be sober in your mind. Men of God, according to Proverbs 31, verses 4 through 6, were to refrain from drinking. 1 Timothy 3, verse 3 and 8. Now look at the Proverbs chapter 34, 31, verses 4 through 6. Now, brethren, this is very important because when we consider leadership, and the more I thought about this, the more I can see why many nations of the world are in trouble. When you think of Russia, I learned this the other day about Russia, that it is a drinking community. They love vodka, and they get drunk all the time. And Brother Eric, these are the ones that are in leadership. Well, if you're in leadership and you're drinking, and you are not thinking clearly, you're going to make decisions based upon your unclear thinking. There's no way a Christian should say that this is okay. The word of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. Watch this. My son. What, my son? And what, son of my womb? And what, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings. Listen, friends. O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor princes intoxicating drink. Why? Lest they drink and forget what? The law. The law. <laughs> and we understand, we, we see how people are drinking today and they just can't seem to think clearly. Of course you can't think clearly. The Bible, the word of God, the roadmap for eternity, the roadmap for morality has demonstrated to us that if we are drinking and we are intoxicating our minds and our bodies, it positions us not to make good decisions. And these are the ones who are leading the people. Here, Lemuel's mother is telling him, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor princes intoxicating drink. Why? Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Brethren, did you see that? We understand that those who are in positions of authority, whether it is the husband, the father in the home, that's a position of authority. Whether it is a leader in the Lord's church, that's a position of authority. Whether it is the CEO of a corporation, that's a position of authority. Whether it is a governor, a mayor, a president, those are positions of authority. Those ought to be the most sober people on the face of the earth. Why? Because you are leading people, especially in the church, where you're not thinking clearly. Why? Because leadership requires making judgments. Leadership are responsible for leading people. Leadership must keep in remembrance the law of God, which is mandatory. And so remember what Habakkuk said in Habakkuk 2 and verse number 15, and how the Jew was not to give strong drink to their neighbor. <clears throat> Now, it's interesting, brethren, if y'all are paying attention, we dealt with leadership and the common Jew. Neither one of them should be giving drink to their neighbor, nor should they be taking it in, lest they pervert justice. Could it be that some judges and some lawyers are not making good decisions because they are inebriated? Because they've been drinking? Because their minds are not clear? Because their minds are foggy? Could it be? I believe that it could be. 
And when we stop and we think about this, I remember when Absalom commanded his servants to watch out for his brothers in 2 Samuel 13, verses 27 and 28. And I find it interesting. And he told them, wait for Ammon to drink. <laughs> He told him, wait for him to drink when his heart is merry. Why? Because Absalom knew that when his heart was merry, now you can encroach upon him and you can take him on. And remember, they killed him. Wow. And usually people get in the most trouble because they've been drinking. Amen. But we still haven't proved the point that I want to prove because I'm still getting there. In 1 Timothy, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, let's look at it from a New Testament perspective. All that was Old Testament. You know, we're still in the Church of Christ and we're still preaching Old Testament doctrine. Sure. And New Testament doctrine. Why? Because the things are written before time, written for our learning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11, take notice. When we think about drinking, when we think about drunkards, in verse number 9 through 11, but especially verse number 11, we are not to keep company with drunkards. We're not to keep company with those who are drinking. Why? Because they are a bad influence. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9 and 10, notice the, the problem with drinking and where it would lead. This is just one of the things. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, starting at verse number 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. You need fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous. What's the next one? Drunkards. Nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Brethren, it's a serious thing. And so when you consider Romans chapter 1, verses 31 and 32, and we are proven of those things, friends, we should not be doing that. But I like verse number 11. Because verse number 11, and every preacher and every teacher ought to be giving hope to those who are finding themselves in these type of situations, correct? Yeah. And he says, and such were past tense language, some of you. Do you understand that he is implying that these drunkards, and let's just focus on them because we can talk about the idolaters and the homosexuals and the sodomites. We can talk about all of them, but there apparently there were some who were drunkards that repented of it and stopped drinking. Stop drinking. Brethren, the Bible is right. And so if we're going to preach the gospel, the whole counsel of God, you got to preach hope to. Amen. So you don't tell people, though, you're going to die in your sins and leave it there. No, you can come out of it. That's why we're telling you what we're telling you. Amen. And so John was told that he would not drink wine nor strong drink, Luke 1, 15. Point number three, social drinking. Social drinking is immoral. I said it is immoral. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 4, I'm sorry, verse number 3, we have the word carousing. Carousing, the King James renders. Let's look at that real quick because I thought it was very interesting in verse number 3. We have drinking parties. Drinking parties. The idea of drinking parties there is the idea of carousing. The idea of having parties where the alcohol is the center of attention. And all of us know about that. We all heard of BYOB, bring your own booze. Isn't that sad? Yes. I've been there, I've done that. And so I don't come across as one that's judging, but I am coming across as one who understands that that still wasn't right. Yes. So when we think about carousing, it's the idea, notice this definition, the idea of giddiness. Headaches caused by drinking wine to excess. The idea of drunkenness comes from the Greek word methe, which is intoxication. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 13 and verse number 13. And we're slowly putting all this together. Slowly putting all this together. Because when we think about Romans chapter 13 and verse number 13, notice what the Bible here communicates. Let us walk properly as in the day. That's enough to preach right there. So if one is walking properly as in the day, he's walking or she's walking a transparent life. You know, you know those night walkers, you know those hookers, those women who give their body away for money. You know, they do things in the nighttime. Why? Because they don't want to be exposed. 
And sometimes when we want to do something that's wrong, we wait till it's dark or we try to go somewhere and hide ourselves. But here he says, walk in the day, be exposed. We live in a time now where people don't even care. They'll drink at any time. And sometimes even in the Lord's church, they sit there and pop a beer open in front of you. You better say something. And he says, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But notice what he says in verse number 14, and we'll go back to verse 13. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and do what? Make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lust. When you think of the idea of reveries, it is, now notice this definition, nocturnal parties, nighttime parties. That's the definition of the word. It includes drinking, the idea of a letting loose. And that's exactly what happens when uh, alcohol enters into the system. You begin to let loose. You begin to lose control. And I find that very interesting because the fruit of the spirit in that is self what? Control. Hmm. Now if drinking parties is the basis of a letting loose when God wants us to keep it tight we need to leave that alone we need to stop that we need to be teaching and preaching that and so Paul calls drinking drunkenness he calls it a work of the flesh Galatians 5 19 Peter would condemn the same thing not in principle only but specifically now that's an interesting point there that I was considering See, a lot of times we want to talk in generalities, but Peter and Paul was talking specifically drunkenness. And as we were dealing with the idea of Methusco, and we'll look at this even further, it's the idea of one being softened by the wine. Which means that as soon as one began to drink, there one drink drunk. And that's the point that he's making right there. So God, why are you so... Uh, why are you wanting men not to drink? Because it removes your thinking. And it causes you to do things that are not in the realm of self-control. And friends, we need to keep that in mind. So social drinking can lead to post and uh, pre- and post-marital sex, idolatry, dismay, and death. Brethren, we're seeing all of these things even in our nation today. And so the Bible is clear. Be not drunk with wine. Don't be softened by the wine, but be ye filled. The Greek word for filled there is plerao. The idea of being filled to the full. Brother Eric, if I'm filled to the full with the Spirit's teaching, I cannot have any drink in me. Amen. There's no room for it. Amen. And so if there's no room for the Spirit's, because I have the Word of God in my heart, then I know for a fact that I need to be living that alone. Point number four, alcohol affects nations. I gotta, I gotta give you these, brethren. When, when we think about this, alcohol affects nations. They're detrimental, it's detrimental to every single life in the nation. Whether a person drinks or not, our lives are affected. We know this because of MAD, M-A-D-D, -D, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. You can have someone going down the street, they're sober as all get out, they're paying attention, they're listening to the oldies, and everything is going well, having a conversation with their spouse, got the children in the back, and somebody, and it's over. Life has changed forever. Don't tell me drinking doesn't affect the non-drinker. We hear things like drink responsibly. I even hated putting that in my notes. I really did. Because can one drink responsibly? The answer is no. Drunk driving has taken lives. Cirrhosis of the liver is prevalent among Americans. Brendan, did you hear that? You know, you can't get cirrhosis of the liver from having a fatty liver. But you can get cirrhosis of the liver from drinking. Why? Because it's damaging the internal parts of the body. At the same time, it's changing your mindset. It's not amazing. No wonder God in his infinite wisdom teaches us to stay away from it. Don't even go near it. It causes, watch this, I'm not trying to be a doctor because I'm not. I just did some research. It causes cancer. 
it disturbs the immune system. It causes disorder and dysfunction even in the immune system. It causes brain damage. It causes dependence. It's the basis for violence. Heart disease. Here it is. Diabetes. Brethren, God is saying you need to stay away from that. Now watch this. Because of drinking, rape is, is on the rise. Jobs are being lost. Homes are being damaged. The rise of teenage drinking is astronomical. People around the world are dying from drinking. Why? Because they're around bodies of water while being drunk. You will drown if your mind is not right. The emotional effects and distress on mental health, and you hear a lot about that today. Well, I need to take care of my mental health. I got my thoughts on that. You stay in the Word of God. You do what you're supposed to do with the Word of God. God will take care of your mental health. Amen. Yes, sir. Ephesians, I'm sorry, Philippians 4, verse number 8, think on these things. 17 million Americans have a drinking problem. 855,000 Americans from 12 to 17 have a drinking problem right now. 12 to 17. Young people, y'all between that age, who's, raise your hand if you're 12 to 17. Raise your hand. You see that? 12 to 17. 855,000 Americans, 12 to 17, have a drinking problem. Here's the question. Where is mom and dad? Probably drinking with them. Brethren, this is not funny. There's nothing funny about it at all. And what problems are they creating? Ephesians 2. Notice this little point right here. As I was thinking about this, I said, that's exactly right. In Ephesians 2, verse 2 and 3, this is the problem that it is creating. Brethren, it's going to be a problem that uh, you probably didn't see. Now watch this. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse number 2. Notice what the Bible here says. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. Here it is, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath just as others. Notice the part, uh, and by nature. The Greek word there is phusis. The idea there is long practice. That's the problem right there. When one begins to drink, they begin to develop a long practice. That long practice begins to affect the body, the mind, the soul, the spirit, the community, the society, the individual. It goes on and on. And so because of the long practice, everything in their life begins to deteriorate. Rather than 855,000 American young people and my wife being a school teacher from ninth to 12th grade, they gloat about their drinking. They gloat about their weed smoking. They gloat about those things and their minds cannot even focus on schoolwork because it's already messed up. Why teach? Why send them to school? You can't learn. So they cause troubles at school all day long. And when I was a kid, probably when you was a kid, you would have one or two. My wife said, it's all of them almost. You got maybe one or two that come to learn. And so a little leaven, leavened the whole lump. What happens when the lump is already leavened? Let me get back to my rest. I've got to hear that almost every day. And I love my wife. And I said, baby, you can come home. You can vent all you want to. And when she gets through, I'm ready to go outside. <laughs> I'm serious. Because I tell her, at a young age, they're already corrupt. They're already drinking, smoking. Their minds are intoxicated with error. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 27, 26. And so the lack of self-control causes one to not follow after Christian principles. Brethren, we need to leave it alone, period. And so uh, we need to take action. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, 
I find it very encouraging. The Apostle Paul is here talking to the brethren here. Notice what he says here. Very familiar passage of scripture. He said, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now watch this. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. How can one who is drunken in their mind, who is in a stupor, who has their mind altered, how can they bring every thought into captivity when their minds won't even operate right? Brethren, we have to take this serious. And we need to be encouraging our brethren to preach the truth on this matter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, we need to be buffeting our bodies. Why? So when we're preaching to others, we ourselves will not become a castaway. But what else about drinking? How do you maintain a good reputation if you're a drunkard? How do you maintain a good reputation if you have a drink in your hand? How do you do that? You're professing the name of Christ, and as soon as you can in public, you're drinking, or in private. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse number 1. Turn your Bibles there and also look at Ecclesiastes 10, verse number 1. Hey, Eric, get Ecclesiastes 10, verse number 1. I get 7 and 1. Notice something here, brethren. I love Ecclesiastes 7 and 1. Because it states a lot for us. That as the people of God, it does matter what people think about us. It matters what God thinks about us. And it shouldn't matter what people think about us. They don't have to agree with me in order to think highly of me. In Ecclesiastes 7 and verse number 1, a good name is better than precious ointment. Brethren, did you hear that? A good name. How can I have a good name around town if they know that I'm professing Christ, a member of the Lord's church, but I'm walking around with a drink in my hand? I'm professing that I don't drink myself, but if you drink, that's on you. No, because if you continue to do that, then what's going to happen when we find ourselves in a position where people are looking at us saying, no, that's not right. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse number 1, what does the Bible say, Eric? Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So here we are in reputation of wisdom and honor, and we have a bad name. Does it matter about drinking? It does matter. Point number five, some falsehoods about drinking. This is where y'all wanted me to go. In John chapter two, you know, they say that Jesus turned water into wine. Y'all remember that? I always love to go to John two and 10 and I like to smash the argument. I don't, I don't play with people. I, I, don't, I don't do a lot of talking with people. I try to get straight to the to the juggler. And those in Texas, they laugh at me. He's like, so why don't you just have the conversation with the person? I said, man, I don't have time for verbal boxing matches. Man, I'm trying to get you out the way. I'm trying to get you out the way hurriedly. I want to go straight to the argument. And so in John 2 and verse number 10, we can deal with the 120 to 160 gallons of liquor that Jesus uh, possibly made, that they said he made. We can talk about Jesus turning water into uh, intoxicating drink. You can talk about those things. He didn't do none of those things. Why? John 2 and verse 10. I go to John 2 and 10, and I just shut it down. And he said to him, every man at the beginning, now this is what they're saying, set out the what wine? Good wine. Now, you would think that this comes from the Greek word agathos. That may not mean anything to you, it does to the Bible student. Because to the Bible student, the word agathos is just a general good. It's not a specific good. But this comes from the Greek word, Brother Jason, kalos. That's different. There is an opposite of kalos, and that's kakos, that's evil. So if something is evil, kakos, that means it's no good. If something is kalos, that's the opposite of kakos, that means it's all good. So whatever Jesus made, it had to have been all good. It had no evil in it whatsoever. 
Brethren, that's a powerful argument. Yeah. So when, the, when I'm talking to people, Brother Harry, I just go straight for the juggler. I ain't got time to be sitting here talking about the 120 and 160 gallons of liquor. I ain't got time to be talking about that. Jesus never sinned against God. He never violated the law. If that's the case, and since that's the case, we know for a fact that whatever he made, it had to be within the realm of good. Had to be. So I don't play with people, man. Because number one, in my mind, don't do all those verbal gymnastics. I'm really kind of linear, I'm black and white, I'm like, no, this is what it says, let's stay with this. But people start to bring in all these different arguments, and I start to be like, no, 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 you know what? Let's go ahead and go right here, let me go ahead and end my conversation with you. We're done. But what they do with it is on them. Go to Matthew 26. You see how I'm done with that already? I'm done with that. Matthew 26. Don't sit there playing with people. You take a knife to a gunfight, you might get nicked. <laughs> we don't want to get nicked. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 28. Jesus' disciples, they say that he drunk, that uh, he was passing around intoxicating wine. As they were eating, verse 26, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, said, take eat this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. But this is my blood of the new covenant, but to share for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this what? Fruit of the vine. Now, we could deal with that phrase right there and end the argument. But I'm going to go ahead and nail this coffin down, okay? Go up to verse number 17. Verse number 17 of Matthew 26. Now, on the first day of the feast of what? unleavened bread. If Jesus was passing around intoxicating wine, then he would have violated the law because during the Passover there should be no what? No leaven. You see, brethren, the Bible is right. Amen. Jesus wasn't passing around intoxicating wine. Jesus was passing around the fruit of the vine. When you think of the fruit of the vine, that which literally comes from the vine itself, in the grape, it is Wine pressed, it is squeezed, it juice comes out. That's what he passed around. You know what we took of today? Fruit of the vine. We're not passing around wine on the Lord's table. Why? Remember 1 Corinthians 5 and verse number 7, Christ is our Passover. And this is the body and the blood representation of Jesus Christ. Brethren, we need to be mindful of that. So I just want to bring that out. This is some of the false doctrine that's around us. So we need to remember that this was during the Passover. No leaven, no yeast is to be done or used during that particular time. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 20. Let me give you another one. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Brethren, I figured, you know, when y'all gave me this topic, I said, you know what, let me deal with some of the false doctrine. Let me deal with some of the things that's being said out there. Because sometimes, you know, we want to be general, but at times you need to be very specific so people can know exactly what the Bible teaches. Amen. So in 1 Timothy chapter 5, you know, I find it very amazing that people want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23 to say that it's all right to social drink. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. However, we'll, we'll entertain it for a little bit. And after we entertain it and we nail it down, we won't hear about it no more. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 23, Paul is talking to Timothy, young preacher. Apparently, he must have been discussing with him by way of a letter of some sort that, hey, I've got some stomach issues and, and I don't really want to drink the water. And so it seems as if he's getting permission from Paul uh, that this is all right. And so what did Paul tell Timothy? No longer drink only water, but use a little oinos, fruit of the vine, that which is freshly squeezed for your stomach's sake and your frequent or often infirmities. Sounds like this is being used as a medicine. We would probably call that today NyQuil. Now, unfortunately, we got people who are drinking NyQuil on the daily. You see us, and it happens. But that was not the intent. The intent was for one to use it from a medical perspective. That's the same thing when it comes to uh, 
uh, pills, pain pills, if you really do pain pills correctly, you use them for the time in which you need to use them, then you leave them alone. Because what will happen? It will begin to alter your thinking. You will begin to be intoxicated from a different perspective. Your body will become dependent upon it. And remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, sorry, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful, watch it now, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Paul, what are you saying? I don't want to be dependent upon nothing but God. And so people, and we live in a time today where, I'll go back to 1 Timothy chapter 5, but let me run this, after this rabbit. He's running pretty fast, I'm going to catch him. But when we stop and we think about this, friends, we got too many people dependent upon things other than God. Well, I've had a bad day, so I need to vamp out and just have a couple of cold ones. No, I just want to, you know, smoke a couple of cigarettes. I just want to smoke a little bit of marijuana, it's a little bit of meth. I, I just need to calm down a little bit. You know, Jesus has an answer for that. Yeah, Matthew 11, verse 28. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. <laughs> Take my teaching upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly and hard. You shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus, what are you teaching? If at any time you find yourself becoming weary and despondent, come to me. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. And so, do away with the drinking. Do away with the, uh, the, the pills, the, the pain pills. Do away with the meth. Do away with the, the weed. In my mind, I'm, man, my mind is moving so fast, I can't even slow it down right now. But do away with that. And trust God. And so Timothy was proof that social drinking is not true. That's medicinal. So as we close, God has called us, brethren, unto holiness and clear thinking. One cannot think clearly if one has their mind clouded. And that's why we dealt with the Greek word nepho. We should always be defending soberness and self-control. I'll end with this, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. From a biblical perspective, I believe that I answered what y'all wanted. In Colossians chapter 3. Since then, I know the New King James renders if then. But the reason why it's since then, because he's talking about those who have already been baptized, according to Colossians 2, verses 11 through 14. Since then, you were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Watch this, friends. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. Brethren, when we stop and consider that, when we think about alcoholic beverages and when we begin to drink and begin the process of softening the inhibitions, our minds cannot be on things above. Why? Because our thinking has just been altered. You died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Do we not know or do we not remember that we have been bought with a price? We belong to God. Therefore, we need to be setting our affections on things above where Christ is. And if we do that, and when we do that, brethren, we know for a fact that we never have to worry about being drunk. It doesn't matter how hard it gets. And brethren, I could have dealt with 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, as it relates to being intoxicated with error, pride. Sometimes we're, we're not thinking clearly because of Pride, And so that's just as bad as drinking. When I'm stuck on myself, when I'm thinking more highly of myself than what I ought to, when I need to keep myself humble. And one thing that I know for a fact, because I've been there and done it and I'm ashamed of it, but I've been forgiven for it, so I don't need to be ashamed about it anymore. That when one begins to drink, they think they're all of that in a bag of chips, and they're not. We're nothing. Amen. And so let's bring it down. Let's bring the pride down. And let's humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And in due season, God will lift us up. 
Maybe you're not a child of God. We want you to be. We want you to be considering the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the very appearance of Christ. Do that. By